Hello and welcome to Getting to Know You. I'm your host, Robert Jakeway. On today's show, I'm going to be speaking with Janet Riker, who is the director of the University Art Museum at the University of Albany. Now, we've been here before, but the exhibits change. So let's talk to Janet and find out what's different. Welcome, Janet. I'm so glad you agreed to uh, have us back as your guest. I'm delighted to have you. Welcome. Well, as with any art gallery or art museum, shows change. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had a fascinating exhibit before. Uh, and now we have, I think, an equally fascinating thing, but very, <laughs> very different. Um, we have two artists. Um, and I want to have you, we had a chat before the show today. And uh, you gave me a little bit of background on how these two guys uh, not only know each other, but have in influenced each other's artwork. So exactly. Um, the two artists are uh, Keith Edmire and Steve De Benedetto, and they are very good friends. They uh, they live both live in New York, and their studios are in a building. Uh, around 36th Street and they've known each other for many many years and they share certain influences um, and interests over that time and I think some of those influences will become obvious as we talk about the work but I can tell you they're both very very interested in film particular films have had an enormous influence on each of their works um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Altered States. Um, they're both interested in psychedelia. Um, and so I think what's really interesting to me is how these two artists share certain interests and influences, but their artwork is very, very different. And I think that will be clear as well. Distinctly different, distinctly different. And now I'm envisioning, I think we talked about this before because I think there was some, some at least some communication between the other artists, but uh, oh, we had a husband and wife actually that That's worked right. together. Um, so do you think Steve call, calls Keith up and says, hey, you got to see what I'm doing today or, or, or? I think it's a probably less, less formal than that, yeah. more like that they get together and they talk about what their work is or, you know, I've been down to have meetings with them and the conversations are very freewheeling and, and kind of bounce around. And so I can imagine, it's easy to imagine those kinds of conversations happening between friends, these two guys. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to start with Steve's work. Sure. Okay, so let's go and, and, and get ourselves set up upstairs. Great. Uh, and then we'll have, continue our conversation. Perfect. All right, Janet, we're up here um, in the upper gallery and we're, we're looking at the, the artwork of Steve mm -hmm. DiBenedetto. Um, and we're focusing on this one first because, as you told me, this has practically all the elements that he has in his other works. And this is called Edge Dwelling. Yes. And I'm going to have you um, give us an idea about what, what the certain pieces are and how this sort of works. Great. Well, I did think this was a good place to start because it combines some imagery that Steve's been working with for a very long time. Um, and one of those is this octopus form down here. Um, you can see its tentacles kind of wrestling up through the canvas and then latching onto a helicopter, which is another form and, and sort of symbol that Steve's used and that we'll see repeated in other works. So this sort of battle between the forces of Earth, this octopus, and I think you can see it in its kind of like earthy tones, and also this kind of symbol of light and air and the helicopter and the mechanism of, of, of modern life. Um, and they're combined in, in, the, in sort of in front of um, a, a new sort of motif that he's been employing, and that is the, the glass-sheathed uh, architect, uh, contemporary modern buildings, and so the architecture of those. And he talks about um, the, this new theme in his work and how each of these little facets, in a way, becomes its own sort of abstract um, painting. It's very intricate. I mean, I, you know, when I, 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 I joked with you uh, before we started shooting because I came up and looked at the paintings and I said, I'm not sure. I've never known that there might be an octopus <laughs> fetish. But, um, you know, the, the octopus is a, uh, definitely a prevalent theme. Mm -hmm. um, I believe there are some that don't have it. And, of course, the helicopter. Um, mm -hmm. And the intricacy. I mean, there's a sci-fi element to it. You talked about the psychedelic quality to Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Um, I'm trying to recall from the movies, well, definitely with altered state psychedelic, mm -hmm. um, that, they're, that they're influenced by. 
but it's it really stands alone and, mm -hmm. and it's it's very very intricate yes um, and I think it catches the eye in many many ways I mean there's a shadow uh, I believe of a, a helicopter there as well mm -hmm. and and the way the colors mix together and um, I think with any artist it may appear to be random mm -hmm. but uh, it's probably very well thought out. Absolutely, absolutely <laughs> in this case. I think he thinks about all of those influences that you mentioned. And um, One thing that I, I think Edge Dwelling happens to be the name of this exhibition as well. He's okay. titled his okay. exhibition that. And I think it's very apropos because in many ways I think his work is sort of this walk on the edge. I mean he talks about kind of controlling chaos and that he wants people to look at his artwork and feel that sort of the ground could move out from under you at any point. So he really wants us to be kind of a little uneasy, a little thrown back, and, and I think there's a sort of um, a kind of, he plays with that randomness and that sort of, you know, haphazard kind of frenetic energy in his work, so. And, and some very interesting, you know, choices of colors um, uh, in contrast to one another. So oh. that you get this sort of, you know, stark, uh, you, know, you know, shots of this sort of iridescent pink uh, fuchsia, is it? Could it be? Yeah, sure. Um, um, and, and, you know, green pops out. So certain colors pop out at you. Right. And you can settle yourself in certain areas as well and also then kind of get jarred and shaken up. Right. Um, That's I bet you could spend an awful lot of time on something like this and, and just really just have a wild time interpreting it. And, uh, and this is one of the advantages. Of I'm going to say here. this several times. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Of coming here and seeing the exhibit with your own eyes. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we're, we're giving sort of like a teaser feeler here. So let's Perfect. move on to some of his other pieces. Great. All right, Janet, we've moved on to some, some uh, other works and the themes are going to be still um, prevalent. Um, but we have different medium or different uh, techniques here. And this one um, uh, is, is done in ballpoint pen, you mm -hmm. said. Um, so, so what are the characteristics here? I mean, it's, it's, it might be pretty obvious, but um, it seems very fine and, and, and very, um, well, fine, I guess is mm -hmm. the word. Sure. But what I love about Steve's work, in, in addition to the themes and the drama of his pieces, are the technique. And in the paintings, I think you can see him using the oil medium. And he's scraping, he's applying, and then removing, and he's incising some of the, of the pigment itself. He builds up this texture. And then to see him move to something as minimal as a ballpoint pen, which we all use on an everyday basis, and create something this wonderful I think to me that personally is a great joy so you can see him using the medium very different ways it is it's this very precise it's about the line it certainly includes some of the imagery but but you can see this sort of dependent on, dependency on the line and building it up in certain places there's a cross hatching in certain other places it almost looks like a maze and so that so it does that it does so it's uh, a really wonderful drawing. I have this image now of, of Steve in a classroom with his composition notebook. And, uh. and being really, you know, not focused on what's being said in front of the room and, and working, you know, very arduously and creating perhaps one of his first... Uh, I don't, uh, I've never asked Steve that question, but I don't have any problem seeing a young Steve doing that. <laughs> and I also see there's uh, color. It's not without color because we definitely have black and then we have we have the blue kind of come up here That's exactly well. right there. Even there, you can see the different shades of black. And I think when an artist like goes to that minimal place of the medium, I think they, and that's what really is wonderful, how he exploits like every dimension of it, like sort of the thickness of the line, the, the difference in tonalities between black, black and a reddish black. So I think that it's a very masterful use of, of a very minimal medium. Nice, very nice, and, and, and really engaging, like with the other works uh, that we've looked at before. I mean, you can just spend a lot of time um, um, musing and following and where your eye will take you and having a lot of fun with it as well. Um, well let's move a little bit and, and see, see some color, but sure. once with a colored pencil. Yes. You know, which is, which is a whole different technique. Okay, I think it's wonderful in a show like this to show different medium and to, to show the, the scope of the artist's work. And I think it's important, just like the ballpoint pen or the charcoal pencil drawings, 
to remind people that you don't need huge canvases or sophisticated medium to create wonderful artwork. So I think that's a connection that Steve makes with his audience that's very direct and immediate. Well, there, you know, it's, it's not vast. It's, it's, it's more manageable, I mm -hmm. guess, for the eye. Um, you know, and, and you know, bouncing off the, the first piece we saw, which was so vibrant and stark, right. um, this is definitely softer, muted, um, mm -hmm. I think very beautiful. Yes. Uh, I mean, there's a set definite beauty here and, and more of a, a sense of calm. Um, um, you know, the colors are very soothing. Uh, even the rainbow down here, mm -hmm. uh, I think, is a very calming thing. So. Uh, the octopus is not a threatening uh, element at <laughs> no. all. It's almost as if it's, it's, it's either suspended or just in, because they can be very elegant creatures. Right, uh, absolutely. For those of us who know octopus. And who, they change their color, yes. as you know. So yeah. octopuses are so one. It's, 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 it's really um, very, very nice. And, uh, um, it's now, nice. Is, is this on paper? It is. Okay. It is. These works we're looking at now are on paper. on paper. And it's interesting to see how the luminosity that we saw in Steve's work on canvas sort of translates through the medium of colored pencil. It's kind of like a, a glow in the dark kind of Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to a, yet another um, um, painting. Okay, Janet, we're, we're now looking at a, um, a piece um, that's done in charcoal. Um, and it's called Disintegration, which is clearly uh, what's happening here. Mm -hmm. So um, can you give us some insights into this particular piece? Sure. I think this piece resurrects the, um, the helicopter motif. Um, and what I really love about it is that, it, it, again, it's that minimum, m minimal sort of technique. Um, but there's so much of the process is, is revealed on the surface of the painting. You can see smudge marks. You can almost, almost see like sort of the imprint of his hand yep, as he yep. worked through this. And I think so, so that sort of carries over to the other work we've seen and sort of it reminds you to look for those marks, that hand, the hand and the touch in Steve's work is very, very important. You're, it's not one of those smooth, pristine surfaces that, that doesn't show the hand of the artist. I mean, Steve is ever present in mind and in the physicality of paint. And you can get a sense that he loves the physicality of whatever medium he's using. It's very interesting when you say that. I don't recall, and maybe this is, this is, is I just have missed it, but I don't see any signing. So what he's really done is he's imprinted himself, as you said, uh, on the canvas itself, um, which is really, really interesting. Now, what I'm seeing in this one, other than the, the uh -huh. motifs and what it, it stands for, and I'm sorry to say I can't remember the artist where, where, that was upstairs before, but I remember distinctly a uh, wonderful painting um, or work that was, I think, in charcoal as well, that had a, a bank of helicopters ah. and then a bank of birds. Yes. And interestingly enough, and I know they're not related, yes, right. I'm seeing this sort of, and who knows, this is a fresh, right. you know, something breaking apart, but there's a similarity here. So I think yes. one of the things that happens when you're, you get into art um, and you start to can maybe draw comparisons to what you've seen before, um, you start seeing things differently, uh, recalling something. So one more reason for our viewers to come and actually experience the art um, and, and you know, maybe we, we are, we're helping them along the way. So that Absolutely. They can, um, you know, and I think there's a whole stigma, don't you, Janet, with understanding art? I don't understand it. I mean, right. um, I'm sure you're really uh, sort of stretched if you stand in front of a blank canvas, uh, mm -hmm. something that doesn't look like there's anything on it, mm -hmm. uh, and you're supposed to somehow, you know, know what's happening here. Right. But I think people should really relax when they come and, and experience art so they can just experience it. I think and that's exactly true. And I, I know that some people feel contemporary art is off-putting in ways. But I, I think that the wonderful thing and the thing that's always sustained me in art is that you can enjoy it on many levels. And I think that if you look and you ask yourself those questions, if you compare and contrast in an exhibition that's well organized, that it helps you to ask the right questions, to think about the things that are, will reward you, and that you can enjoy it on many, many levels. And that the more you know, the more you see, the deeper you'll be able to go with that. But I, I agree with you completely. Um, taking the time to look really closely and ask yourself questions is, 
is like one of the best ways to find entrance into works of and art. And also like we're doing to have a conversation about it. I mean... Um, Go with a friend. Absolutely. Absolutely. Shared experience. Now we're going to, we're going to end um, our look at Steve's work uh, with another charcoal, I believe, that, that um, sort of has one of the prevalent images you talked about in mm -hmm. the beginning, and that is the, um, the close encounters right. a relation, relationship. So let's go look at that one, and then we're okay. going to go down. And, and okay. I know we said we, were, we had looked at the last piece with the last piece. We, we, that was the end of our, our looking at Steve's work. But one of the things that I noticed and we had talked about was mm -hmm. the um, different um, I wasn't going to say canvases mm -hmm. um, that these, these works have been done on. Paper, uh, regular canvas, um, which is cotton. And then I, there's a whole bank of pictures that are done on linen. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, understand through conversation that linen has, it's, it's longev there's a longevity factor mm -hmm. there. Uh, and they're all treated so they don't absorb and splatter all around here. But this one in particular um, is, a, is a whole different um, I would say canvas type. Right. And it does different things as a result, the, the, the work on it itself. Right. So let's talk about this for a minute. This is one of the new, Steve's newest piece, pieces, uh, a, a new body of work that he's doing on polypropylene, which is really sort of a kind of plastic. And so it really takes the pigment in a very different way from um, canvas, or linen, or paper. Uh, it doesn't absorb, so the pigment sort of pools on the surface of, of the, the, what we would call the support. So okay, support. whatever the medium is applied to, the pigment is applied to, is called a support. Okay. So that, so that it's, it's really radically different. And I think that it's sort of, um, again, it reminds us of the, the kind of master, his masterful use of materials that he takes so easily to this and creates similar effects um, that he, as he does in canvas or on, and with oil paint and on, um, on paper. So I think it's so interesting to look and see how this medium, you can't go back in and, and sort of scrape off. It, it, and it dries very, the pigment, the gouache and watercolor pigment dry very quickly on the surface. And so it's, it's a very interesting... So it's what's done is done. Absolutely. So, um, I, I love it because there, there is still this, um, a bit of the softness, but also mm -hmm. infused with kind of the starkness. And, right. and by goodness, there is that tower, that glass tower there. So um, I love it. Now, was this, do you know, um, in talking to him, or did he reveal, is, yeah, this was new for him, but is, is, this, is this done by other artists on this particular uh, yes. surface? Yes, uh, artists have been using this kind of, of plastic support or um, mylar is another okay. surface, and so, um, and so it has been for just those unique qualities. I think artists are looking for um, material that, that um, stretch their um, ideas and their abilities and, and provide just a, a, a different um, response to their talents. Excellent. Well, let's go downstairs and look at Keith's work. Great. Janet, I had to come to this picture, as I told you before, the, you know, when you talked about the influences on this artist's work, uh, you mentioned Close Encounters, and if, if anything in this whole exhibition is the Close Encounters uh, work, this one certainly is. I mean, you have, you know, the Devil's Tower before it's been lopped out. You have this wonderful, um, if you know the movie, you have the, the, the image that's on the screen that somehow the guy somehow just doesn't quite see. But he also incorporates um, the octopus and, and, and some of the other elements. And one of the things that um, I, I, I noticed was that because we don't have color here, I think we're more atten pay more attention to the detail, mm -hmm. but it's also a softer um, uh, work. It, 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 it's, a, it's a quieter. There's the helicopter in there, almost, mm -hmm. almost, almost like it's a, a vague image. Right. Um, so it, it, it's really uh, you know, very careful, a lot of lines. Um, you see all the things that artists do in this kind of thing, you know, you, if you know art at all about perspective and, and proportion and all that, although there's kind of whacked out of shape. I mean, how many people have Devil's Tower in the middle of their <laughs> lives? But uh, there is symmetry, there is order. Um, I think because we don't have that color thing that sort of jars us up, it's a bit less uh, chaotic. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. And once again, this is, this is charcoal. Um, and. and uh, has that wonderful quality, I think, because it's charcoal. Okay. 
Okay, we've descended the staircase and we're now in the world of Heath Edmire. Um, and although there is uh, tremendous influence and uh, in their backgrounds as to how their art is manifested, there's really a distinct difference. I mean, we don't have canvas pieces here. Um, and this guy was really into, I must admit, a lot of the stuff that I was as a kid. <laughs> uh, so this is like a real thrill for me um, with um, magic, mm -hmm. um, um, makeup, right. special effects, monsters. Right. Um, so he's had a really an interesting career um, prior to actually being the artist, right? Although I would say that the things that he did as far as special effects and makeup were also artistry as well. Yes, yes. Keith's interest in this area of magic and makeup and prosthetic devices started when he was a child. And um, as soon as, and he was, as a child, he was creating things and studying and writing to great makeup artists whose work he was emulating. Um, there's a story about how um, his high school senior uh, play production was Jesus Christ Superstar, and he actually made a prosthetic for the back of the Jesus character that oozed blood when he was flagellated. And so you get this sense of this kid who is very, very intense. So when Keith graduated from uh, high school, he headed to L.A., where he began sort of apprenticing himself to some of the people that he had corresponded with during his, his youth. And so he actually worked as a makeup artist and special and prosthetic and special effects person on some TV um, and movie productions, notably The Fly. And so what we see here is um, a, a life cast of Jeff Goldblum with the facial prosthetics from The Fly movie. And then in the upper photographs, we have the young Keith, who is sort of trying on the makeup test um, for, the, for the movie. Yeah, you, you so. know, if you know the movie at all, you see sort of the bubbly underneath the skin kind of thing. Exactly. And, uh, Exactly. And he actually he actually went on a show. Um, on a, his hometown is Chicago, right? Precisely. So he's a Chicago boy yep. and has a lot of Chicago influence. So he actually, at the age of 14, and there's a little mm -hmm. video here, yes. he actually went on a show and sort of you know, showed his stuff, didn't exactly, he? Exactly, exactly. So we do have that video as well. And so as well as this is a life cast of him that, himself that he made as a young man. Fascinating. You know, one, one, one would want to know what the parents might have thought, although I would say that because he was able to flourish, that they probably encouraged him, even if they thought he might be a bit odd. Well, we, we've talked about that here, and I think it's prob and his parents are enormously supportive, and I think that, um, like anything, when you see a child who has a certain a deep interest that is obviously transcends just sort of a, you know, a casual interest. I think parents try to support and encourage and him to and go where it would. And one would want to pass that message on, that if you have a child that, that, that exhibits these particular mm -hmm. um, um, aspects, to, to really see if you can encourage and see yeah. where they go. Look, look what happened You don't know him. where it can you don't go, know right. You know, really. Love it. Another one also, and we talk about monster films, but it, I think because they have such a wonderful um, um, special effects quality to him. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a, a part of the exhibit that shows a King Kong theme, right? Um, and you right. see um, a mask uh, of of the ape, and you see a mold, right? And you see the pollster, and this is a King Kong uh, in the in the the one that was done around the World Trade Center. That's right. Yeah. With Jessica yeah. Lange. Yeah. So, there's that aspect is also, mm -hmm. you okay. mentioned, because you, you'd mentioned how many people right. come to these. Right, right. And I, I know, Robert, that, that many of these things have a special resonance for your, ch your childhood, but I find that what's so amazing is that so many people have said that to me, have come in and said, oh, gracious, you know, I was consumed with clowns when I was a kid, or I was, I loved magic, or I couldn't get enough, you know, of, of makeup or King Kong, and I think, that that is part of what Keith is mining here is the enormous power of these childhood memories and the influence that they have on us. And so in a way, he's almost like, it's almost like an exorcism. He's like pulling out all these childhood memories and, and latching on to them, you know, in a way not to get rid of them, but to fix them and to, and to focus on them and hold them in a kind of safe place.
I know there's a whole case that has 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 false teeth um, because he, he worked with a dentist or and created those. And I must tell you, there's there's a set in there that if I had seen those when I was a kid, uh, there's a set, there's a pair of fangs in there that I would love to have. So uh, maybe I can get myself fitted sometime. <laughs> Absolutely, we can talk. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> well, Janet, I had to stop at this part of the exhibit because um, we talked about this foray into our childhood mm -hmm. and you know whether it's my inner child or whatever have you. Um, the minute I saw this particular thing, uh, which is a sort of a, an homage to a particular um, magician, um, but it's a it's a 9.95 at the time <laughs> magic show, magic kit, um, and, and some other other things here. Um, and I, I mentioned to you before that one of my best Christmas gifts when I was a child was Sneaky Pete's Magic Show. Mm -hmm. So that really dates me. But, you know, to have the affinity for the illusion, the whole oh. idea of illusion and, 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 and tricking the eye. Um, obviously is, is something that carried him forward into the other stuff. Oh, does. absolutely. I think there, there is a great connection between um, magic and his artwork you know, as, a, as an installation artist. I mean, what we've been looking at are really the influences on Keith as a young man. And as we've talked about before, it's wonderful for us to have an opportunity to kind of open up an artist's brain and look inside and see all the amazing influences that are, that affect the work that he does. And, and that's what we've done here with this exhibition. And it's particularly meaningful to do it in a university gallery museum where you have so many students who are studying art on the undergraduate and graduate level come through and to kind of for them to have that opportunity as well as for general audiences I think it, it's it's something a lot of artists will not share those influences with the public they want to be seen and known for their artwork right. as as it right. exists and as they are willing to put it out there and, and are not willing to even talk about some of the deeper influences. So here you have someone who's really kind of mining that territory and, and, and bringing it forward for everyone to look at. So it's a unique opportunity. I love the, I love the use of the word mining. Uh, mm. you know, and, you know, this, this, is the first, this is the first part of the exhibition that you see when you walk into the gallery. Right. Um, and your first you know, impression is, is, is it the sort of like, I just stepped into to a childhood. Right. Um, very right. much so. And, and it was very interesting. Um, we talked about the setting and, and the influences. And we had a conversation, I think it, it, it's worth repeating, um, about the, the color of the walls. Mm -hmm. um, Keith was very precise and wanted the walls of the gallery painted. Uh, it's a Roscoe brand chroma key paint. And it's a professional product that's used in television theatrical performances. It actually was more used before the current green screen, which I think probably viewers will be familiar with. But um, before that, it was the Roscoe blue screen, and it was used for things like weather reports or special effects, again. Um, and I think what it has and brings to the, to the museum is this intensity of color and also a kind of luminous quality. Absolutely. I mean, it, it encases the whole thing, and it, yes. it, it, it's very, it's very appealing. Also, I mean, yeah. I guess it's comforting as well. But I think the influences are really significant, and especially since um, where we're going to end up, uh, you know, more in the, a studio actually right. um, is very pertinent to it. So we're going to shift the camera around, and we're going to go and look at another TV influence, right. and what I think is a very delightful part of the uh, exhibit. Thanks. Janet, one of the things that I'm always tempted to do, especially when I come here, is to talk about everything I see, but our objective is to get people to come here. Right. But I did want to focus in on this wonderful little um, um, collection revolving around a, a television show, and it was a Chicago television show, yes. right? Um, where it was a, a host who actually occupied, and with these characters here, uh, occupied the Giggle Snort Hotel. Um, and one of the wonderful things that you said was is that these were actually borrowed from the Museum of Broadcasting, right? So these are originals, yes. right? Yes. These were borrowed from the Museum of Broadcast Communication in Chicago, which was very generous to us and lent some of these 
um, puppets. Bill Jackson was considered a, a television innovator, and Giggle Snort Hotel was one of his uh, pr one of his productions. And these puppets are from that, and I think there's one puppet from Dirty Dragon, and they're just such wonderful kind of embodiments of 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 childhood and and we've all known these sort of sort of quasi ugly quasi <laughs> charming characters you know well, from that so, world we're so fixated on, on, on the Sesame Street and the ones that are national but right. realize that in that particular area something so creative was going on and exactly. I imagine it influenced a lot of young people oh exactly um, um, who if they were to know that their friends were reassembled here <laughs> right. they'd, come, they'd come and visit them <laughs> right um, one of the things also that I find very interesting and really works in this exhibit is that there are little monitors um, mm -hmm. in several of the places. Uh, we saw the one of Keith before uh, at 14, but also a part of the Magic, um, Magic right. Man's show. Right. And there's also playing, and maybe we're picking up a little bit of these sounds, these I television sounds. We probably sounds are. Talking through. There's also some footage here from, from this particular um, uh, place and, and, and wonderful. So it really puts it in context of mm -hmm. what it was. Right. Um, interesting, interesting stuff. So and I also know that there was a very important clown that was an influence to, to Keith and we should do a, a bit of an homage to him as well. Um, and you can tell the, your, your story as well as when, when what was happening when the exhibit was put together. So let's go visit Bozo. Okay, here we're, we're, here we're at the, 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 the Bozo part of the piece, and you know, uh, um, uh, which is a lot of fun. And, and because this was a Chicago uh, generated, I believe, originated there show, obviously it was influenced. And one of the things in the, in the, in the placard you have to sort of explain this uh, part of the exhibit, um, you know, it's very pertinent, I think, to the whole exhibit um, and what the clown represents mm -hmm. and the fact that the clown um, is neither child nor adult, but sort of a, um, 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 a, a transition, transition figure. Transition right. figure. <laughs> um, so, you know, bringing, bring, having your adult come and having your child come out, um, right. um, I think is, is very relevant to this whole, the whole exhibit. So. And one of the fu fun things is in this, in this little uh, piece over here is that Keith himself is, 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 a, is a portrait or a picture of him playing Bozo. Absolutely. So talk about getting into your character. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. right. Yes. And that was the, that image we chose for our invitation because it was such, he, for him it really spoke to what he's trying to capture in the exhibition as a whole. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. And really an a interesting, a, a bit of a sad story, but an interesting story because you set the exhibit up on July 4th. Well, we were working, yeah, through, through the weekend and so we were all here on July 4th and someone came in and said, did you hear that Larry Harmon had actually, who was the, the bozo that many of us remember and who actually sort of um, codified what bozo dumb was and trained many of the artists throughout the country who who played bozo larry Harmon died on the had just died on wow. the third so we were all kind of a little had a little interesting moment of silence and, and this is respect. this is really the, the manifestation of, of larry um the doll is actually larry as bozo it is uh, and it was keith's you know. when he was a child so so i'll never be insulted again if someone calls me a bozo right <laughs> 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 or isn't it Firestein Theater who said we're all bozos we're all on this <laughs> bus, right? <laughs> okay, let's go back to what is a studio. Um, Absolutely. And, and have some conversation about um, the exhibit, when, when people mm -hmm. can visit it, uh, hours and all that stuff. Sure. So let's make another transition. All right, Janet, this is the part of the program where we're going to talk about some particulars. and mm -hmm. and. We, I chose this, this to end because it, it really, it, it's the first thing you see when you walk in the doors, right. and it's so wonderful here. Um, this is a, a recreation, uh, help me here, sure. of a particular set from a show um, that uh, Keith, I'm sure, was um, in love with. And um, we've got this whole idea of, of, a, of a set, and um, the, there's a camera here, there's a boom mic, mic boom here, there's spotlights up here. And I remember we were walking through the exhibit and I saw the time and I'm saying something's wrong about the time here. We're a little off. I checked my clock and I realized 
it's set to Chicago time. Absolutely. Um, and I understand you have to do a special thing each day. Right. Every day, um, Keith's asked us if we would post the date and um, the weather in Chicago, of course, and then also the baseball and scores for Chicago teams. And um, this set is based on the Ray Rayner show, which was for two decades, it was a staple of Chicago television. And so what Keith's done is sort of recreate the set from the clock to the stuffed animal. And this is actually um, a recreation of, um, of the jumpsuit that Ray Rayner wore on the exhibition, I mean, on the TV show. And, and he said he was inspired to do this here because of the sort of architecture of the museum that has this sort of gallery upstairs and it sort of reminded him of, in a sense, a stage set. So that was kind of the inspiration. And we have another itself. borrowed object here that's authentic to the we actual do. show itself and that's this uh, is it a drum? It is. It's a barrel um, with a duck on it. I don't know Almost much looks about like the duck, duck, but it does like look duck. a little like that. Don't want to know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Looney Tunes is very particular about its trademark, and um, and then also the Schenectady Museum was good enough to lend some material, and um, also the New York State Museum was generous in lending um, authentic museum uh, um, television studio material from from the era. So. Gee, me thinks it takes a lot to put on a, uh, a show, doesn't it? Yeah, it, <laughs> it keeps us busy, right? Right, it does. And this was, it was certainly, um, it was an adventure. <laughs> and a real joy, I mean, you know, uh, juxtaposed to the other exhibit, uh, which was wonderful itself, mm -hmm. the, the way the space looks now, the transformation right. of the space itself, which I think is wonderful. And that's part part of I think the challenge or the excitement we'll call right. it excitement of all this. Right. Um, now this exhibit just opened. Yes. And it's going to run through how long? Through September twenty first. Okay. So there's a there's a good chunk of time. Oh yeah. All right. And we have you know people who are looking for things to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it's free of charge. Absolutely right? yes. Um, and so can you talk about? the hours in the summer because we're really we're sure. really going through the summer months here sure. what are the hours for sure. if you need a crib sheet go ahead i'm going to i'm going to look at my sheet so that i make sure that i give you the right hours okay um, because we do have summer hours and they are from tuesday through saturday 11 to 4 um, and after Labor Day, the exhibition will also be on view Tuesday through Friday, 10 to 5, and Saturday and Sunday, noon to 4. So, yes, there's lots of opportunities to see the exhibition and um, free parking in the visitor lot on the weekends. Okay, so. on the weekends. That's yes. important to know. Yes. And also, if you go, just put some simple words into Google. Uh, we have your website. We can put that up, so, up, up sure. also so that people can get an idea. Um, I think there might be directions um, available Absolutely. on there. So it's not yes. a hard place to find. No. Nope. And they can see some new transformation happening on campus here as well, if people know oh, the yes, campus here. Oh, yes, our wonderful pla uh, new plaza. The new plaza fountain. with fountains mm -hmm. and all that kind of sure. stuff. Uh, but more importantly, know exactly where this museum is. Yes. Uh, and not only this exhibit, for it, but exhibits right. to follow. Right. So we're albany.edu slash museum, and that will get you right to the museum's homepage. That's, so. that's simple. Yep. Janet, we're, we're, we're really at the end of our time together, which is sort of sad for me, but, <laughs> but this is a second visit, so I know I'm coming back. Okay. You know, so watch out. I'll be delighted know. to have you come back. Is there anything we missed in, in this conversation? Because we tried to get a lot in and, and still not reveal the whole essence of the, of, the, of the exhibit. We did. But is there anything we I guess what I would say, and I, 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 the way I think of these two exhibitions in a way, is, is really the word adventure. And you know, if you think about an adventure, whether it's the Three Musketeers or the Lord of the Rings, um, they share certain characteristics and you can have an adventure leaving home or you can have an adventure going back home but it's never home and I think in a way that for me is a thread that connects these two artists that that Steve's is taking you on a wonderful adventure through his painting and his artwork and his imagery and Keith is also it's an adventure and he's taking you back in time and and it's familiar but 
you know it's not home. And so I think that I would invite viewers to come and share the adventure and enjoy both shows. Interesting. And, and I would love the opportunity to, to talk to these two cats because I, re I really, I bet, I bet it's, just, it's just phenomenal, you know, and to have wild. a conversation with them. And so thank you again, Janet, for inviting uh, me and us to, to the museum again. It's always delightful talking with you. And I, as I said before, I know we're going we're gonna to talk again Great. soon. Great. A pleasure.